Hi, I'm Nora Saul, your moderator, and today we'll be talking about diabetes and Alzheimer's. When we think of diabetes, we normally think of the heart and the kidneys and the eyes as being organs at risk. But today we're going to talk about the brain because it truly is an organ at risk. And I'd like to introduce our panel today, Dr. Vera Novak and Dr. Gail Musin and Dr. Meta Munchie. And our first question today is going to be for Dr. Novak. Dr. Novak, we've heard that Alzheimer's is described as the third type of diabetes. Can you comment on that? Well, diabetes increases aging in the brain, and age is the main risk factor for the Alzheimer's disease. So that on average, at the age of 80, about half of older people are at risk of dementia or already have an early Alzheimer's disease. That means that in diabetic patients, these changes in the brain are occurring at a much earlier age. Another risk is that diabetes also reduces blood flow to the brain, causing more stress to the neurons, and these changes occurring throughout the whole brain, and also diabetes reduces the reduction of the waste product and increases formation of some characteristics like amyloid plaques that are also found in the Alzheimer's disease. In Alzheimer's disease, however, changes in the brain occur in the specific regions like hippocampus that is very important for the memory foundation. Thank you. So, Dr. Musin, your research is specifically on the brain and diabetes. Can you tell us a little bit about what you found um, in terms of how diabetes changes both the anatomy and physiology of the brain? Sure. Um, in diabetes, people tend to have marginally smaller frontal and temporal lobes, the volume of the brain, and these regions are very important for cognition. So that's one thing. Another thing is that we've used techniques called functional MRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, which is a technique that looks at the blood oxygen level in the brain. And using this technique, it's been found that people with type 2 diabetes show altered communication between a set of, set of regions that is very important for self-regulation and self-monitoring. And the reason why this is so important is because this has also been shown to be an early indicator of people who have a possibility of getting Alzheimer's disease. It has been shown in people at genetic risk for Alzheimer's disease. So that's why it's somewhat worrisome to see this in patients with um, type 2 diabetes. So we've been talking a little bit about the changes that happen in the brain with people with type 2 diabetes um, and in Alzheimer's disease. Um, Dr. Munchie, you work with geriatric patients in the clinical setting. Can you tell us a little bit about the presentation? So when you see an older patient in the clinic, there is actually no difference in the way they present as far as whether someone has dementia uh, with vascular dementia or Alzheimer's disease. They do have, you know, typically when we think about dementia, we think about memory. And sometimes that's not true because brain has many different functions. So it could be memory or it could be judgment, it could be language. There are many different aspects of brain that can be affected and they would present it in different way. In particular, in diabetes, we also worry about what is called frontal lobe dysfunction, which is a front part of the brain that actually controls the behavior such as uh, changing in the, in the uh, uh, you know, starting a new behavior, stopping old behavior, problem solving. And these patients can be living in a community. Uh, they usually don't present with any uh, major defect, but they sometimes can have more difficulty taking care of their diabetes because diabetes, in, diabetes involves changes in the diet and medications and insulin and so forth. So um, we've worked together in clinic. For instance, a patient who might be taking insulin four times a day, um, previously doing fine as they have more cognitive decline, they might have difficulty with something like that. That's correct. And sometimes that could be the only presenting symptom that patients come in because they don't have truly defect in the memory. It's more uh, concentrated defect on the frontal lobe 
And if they were not given a complicated regimen, we would probably never know. So there are many different ways one might present. Great. Um, going back to you, Dr. Novak, um, there has been some information out there that um, insulin deficiency in the brain might be causing some of these problems with cognition. Can you speak to that? And um, if there's any research out there for possible treatments? Well, <clears throat> brain is dependent on insulin, and there are many receptors in the brain in several regions that have abundant number of the insulin receptors. However, brain depends on the transport of insulin from the periphery, from the blood, through the blood-brain barrier, and that is, this transport is damaged in diabetic patients. So there is a insulin resistance and an insulin deficiency in the brain in older diabetic patients. As a result of that, insulin plays an important role in many brain functions. For example, memory, found memory formation, signaling among different brain regions, and also regulations of different rhythms in the brain, like the hunger, satiety, or even sleep. In terms of new treatments or treating of insulin resistance, there are only pilot studies that suggests that insulin delivery through the nose, so-called intranasal administration, may improve memory and cognition in older adults. These studies, including ours, are pilot, and larger prospective trials are needed to determine whether this treatment could be used for prevention or treatment of cognitive deficit in older diabetic patients. Uh, so they're not ready for prime time yet, are they? Not yet. Oh, that's too bad. But I've heard some research say that there's sort of a use it or lose it component to bra the brain, how the brain works. Can you speak, uh, Dr. Musin, to that? Sure. Um, there's something called cognitive training mm -hmm. where people can um, practice particular tasks. And there are some programs out there and what you do in these is you basically practice specific tasks like memory tasks or crossword puzzles or something like that. And the data show that these can be helpful, but the person has to be very diligent and practice a lot. And that the results are specific to the task that you study, that you actually practice with. Um, there has been some research showing, when looking at the brain after some uh, months of practice, and it's shown that there is some marginally improve, marginal improvement in brain volume in certain regions. That the white matter integrity, the white matter is a little bit healthier in certain regions. And um, also that the cortex, that the cortical thickness is improved so that there's a, a thicker cortex. Um, and so that's what we've seen so far with cognitive training. Anything else the panel would like to say before we talk to Dr. Munshi about how patients and their families can handle um, declining cognitive function? So I, I think the, the one uh, major point I would uh, want to put across is that, that to be aware of this, mm -hmm. that many times we don't associate cognitive problems with diabetes. And, and what happens is that patients do not recognize that, families do not recognize that, we, the medical providers, do not recognize that. And it's important to know that because one is that we can do something about it. For vascular dementia, we would, we would manage their blood pressure, their blood sugar, their cholesterol more strictly and prevent further regression. Um, for Alzheimer's disease, we, can, we have some medications that can prevent the rapidity with which that declines. But also, when we give them treatment regimen, then sometimes if it is too complicated and patients have cognitive problems, then it overwhelms them. So they be, their quality of life suffers and they might make a lot of errors. So I think we need to be aware of that. And as more research gets done, hopefully we'll get more, uh, more to do about that. Well, thank you all for coming here today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, Laura. You.